Hello everyone. I'm so glad that you decided to join us again this week as we study God's Word together. Uh, just before we go into a time of prayer, uh, I do have a prayer request. And uh, it's just the same request that I asked you to pray for last week and just ask that you would continue to be in prayer for the church leadership team and myself. Uh, we will be having a uh, online meeting on Monday night uh, to uh, talk and discuss and uh, do our best to plan the process that we'll need to go through in order to start having uh, in-person uh, worship services, although to a limited capacity, uh, but that's uh, according to AHS, uh, all that we're able to do and uh, are looking forward to, to that. And so if you could just be praying for us, uh, that we would have God's wisdom as we go through all of the different uh, steps that we need to for that process and uh, guide us in the timeline that we need to have uh, in order to do that properly and in the best way that we can engage you, our people, and uh, the, those that will be able to be here, only a few at a time, uh, and so then those also that will be at home and, and how we go about doing that. So if you could just be praying over us about all of that, uh, then we would really appreciate that and, and we look to see how God will guide us all through that in the days to come. Let's just take some time right now to pray as we go and look into God's Word and seek Him for what He wants to teach us today. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds uh, to what He wants to tell us. Bow with me wherever you are uh, and let's go to our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and thankful to you for how you love us and care for us and how you have been providing for us and uh, strengthening us in uh, this uh, long time of uh, isolation and uh, through this COVID-19 and all that that entails. Uh, Lord, we're grateful that we are in your hands and uh, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the difficulties, we can always uh, trust in you. You are always faithful and we want to praise and thank you for that. We want to thank you for this time that we have today to look and study in your word. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open our eyes, our spiritual eyes and our ears to hear and see what you want us to learn today, uh, to help us to uh, be open to how you want to mold and shape us to be the people that you desire for us to be as we seek to, to follow you, to glorify you, uh, and to, to be uh, your people. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And we ask all of this in the powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We're, we're going to learn about trusting God and trusting his process today. Uh, but I want to start off by uh, just letting you know that, uh, you know, God has a way of always at he's let me let me start that again by saying that God is always at work and he's always looking for ways to teach us if we're open and listening to what he has to say to us uh, all through our life uh, every moment of the day God is always at work and uh, we can choose to join him or or not and it's so much better when we cho choose to join him and so when he's always at work, one of the things that he's always at work doing, not only is he, as we looked at last week, looking to save the world, uh, he's also helping us as his uh, people who desire to follow him to learn more about who he is and to learn more about how to be the people he wants us to be so that we can reach out to a world that so desperately uh, needs to be saved. And so we need to always be keeping our eyes and our ears open to what God is doing around us. And an example of that is, uh, is just today. As I was uh, finishing up studying and preparing my notes uh, to record this message, uh, I went I'm here in the church building as I'm doing this, and uh, I went downstairs uh, to go warm up some, my lunch. 
And as I went down to the bottom of the stairs, there was a pool of water uh, at the bottom of the stairs. And I thought, oh no, what, what am I going to do? What's, what's, what's happening here? What's, what's going on? Uh, I'm trying to finish up things and, and now I've got to deal with this uh, mess. Uh, what am I going to do? And, and so as I'm mopping up the water and trying to figure out what do I need to do and, and, and how do I handle this, God reminded me of the message that I was preparing for, which was to trust God and, and trust His process. And so the whole time that I'm, uh, I'm mopping, uh, God is, is, is whispering into my ear, it, it seemed, just trust me, trust my process. Uh, and, and as soon as I started to remember that and put that into practice, all of a sudden I started to calm down, I started to relax and just realize, okay, God is going to help us with this, uh, whatever it's going to take and uh, whatever we need to do. Uh, I don't need to worry about it. I just need to put it in his hands and, and do the best that I can and, and trust him uh, to handle uh, whatever the, the, the difficulty or the troubles are. And so uh, here's a real, very practical example uh, of what I'm going to be talking and, and what God has laid on my heart to share with you today is just in our everyday lives. We're going to look at Scripture, and we're going to look at some, an example in Scripture. But I hope that you realize every time we get together and we study God's Word, that there is always an application to our everyday life today. God's Word is as true today as it was when it was written, when it was told to the, to the person uh, that wrote it down in the, in the Bible, uh, to, the, to the, when he taught it to the people of Israel, when he taught it uh, way back all the way even to Adam and Eve when he was teaching them. And so all of God's word is relevant to today and he is always willing and looking for ways to teach us and help us to learn and help us to grow in our walk with him. And so that was just another great reminder for me today and a practical way of applying what he is teaching us. And so let's look at uh, trusting God and uh, trusting his process. I want us to start off by looking in John chapter 14 verse 1. If you would, if you have your Bibles, uh, if you would uh, go there with me and uh, you can read along with me in John chapter 14 uh, verse 1. Uh, and I'm reading from the New International Version and uh, the Bible tells us this, this is Jesus talking to his disciples, and he says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, and trust also in me. Oh, sorry, that was not from the New International Version. That's from the New Living Translation. This, uh, this verse is happening in uh, John chapter 14. is just prior to uh, Jesus uh, going into Jerusalem and... Uh, having the Last Supper with the, with the disciples right before his crucifixion and then his resurrection three days later. And so he's doing some teaching and preparing the disciples for what's about to come. And as I said, this teaching isn't just for the disciples at the time. He was teaching it for them all the while knowing very clearly that it was going to be written down and was going to be here for us to learn today and forevermore for as long as God intends for us to be uh, on this earth. And so, this passage is not just to the disciples. Jesus is saying this to us right here, right now, in this very moment. He's saying, do not be troubled. Uh, we've got a lot of things going on around us. Uh, normally, there's a lot of things that are happening in our lives and, and a lot of things that are coming at us, and we have Lots of uh, journeys, different kinds of journeys, uh, mountains to climb, uh, barriers to try to get over, struggles that we try to wrestle with, hurdles we, we have to try to get over. And all the while, uh, instead of focusing on the problem and how difficult that is and, and getting weighed down uh, with the burden of that, Jesus is reminding the disciples here, and he's reminding us today, he's reminding us right now this morning, that we don't need to be troubled. Why don't we need to be troubled? Because we can trust God and we can trust in Him. God is, a, is an almighty, 
powerful God. I mean, he, he's the only God that there is, and he's the God that brought the universe into existence. He is so amazing, so powerful, that he simply spoke creation into existence, just with a word. I mean, there was, the Bible tells us that there was just darkness everywhere, and he, God spoke and said, let there be light. He didn't even have to snap his fingers. He didn't have to wiggle his nose. Uh, if some of you remember that show, uh, all he had to do was speak, and the universe was created. That's an amazing amount of, of power, and uh, that's the uh, God and, and King of all kings, Lord of all lords, the God of the universe, is the God that loves us and ha wants and desires a personal relationship with each and every one of us. And through his son Jesus, he's telling us, you don't need to be troubled. You can trust in me. I'm always going to be there for you. Now, I, all through scripture, we see time and time and time, one after another, where God is always faithful. He is always trustworthy. He always fulfills his promises. He always does what he says he will do. Never is there a time when God is not responsible, is not faithful, is not trustworthy. Uh, in my own life, I can attest to that. I can witness to the fact that God is always trustworthy. And so Jesus has been teaching his disciples for uh, three years now at this point, And he's wrapping things up by teaching them, remember this. Now, the, the disciples aren't totally aware of what's about to happen. They know there's some danger with them coming into Jerusalem because they know that the, the, the religious leaders of the time are, are out to get Jesus. But Jesus is very aware of what's about to happen. And he knows the stress and the concern and the trouble that's about to come. And so he's reassuring his disciples and he's reassuring us today, you don't need to be troubled. Trust me. One of my, uh, well, two weeks ago on Mother's Day, uh, I shared uh, Kathy's life verse. Uh, today I want to share with you uh, my life verse. And that's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 because it has to do with trust, of course. And so Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Or sometimes uh, you can read that last part as saying, he will direct your path, uh, is, the, is the same meaning there. And so, what we want to, I want to focus in on, that first statement, do not let your hearts be troubled. Or no, sorry, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. We so often, especially in this age of information, where we have so much information, we rely on the knowledge, on the science, on, on our own ability, on our own uh, talent and capability of trying to think through things logically and to solve the problem. And so we approach every situation that way where we've got to try to solve the problem. And it, it oftentimes, it, it on, only in the, in the place where we come to desperation do we finally cry out to God and ask him for help. Well, Jesus is telling us that we need to trust him. And in this proverb, in chapter 3, verse 5, God is telling us very specifically not just to trust in him, but to not rely on our own wisdom, to not rely on our own knowledge and capacity to try to figure out the solution to the problem, to try to figure out how things need to be done, and then to do it with all of our gusto. If we just try hard enough, then we're going to accomplish it. God is teaching us that we need to trust him. We need to not rely on ourselves, but to start to learn 
as we remove ourselves from the worldly way of thinking and start using spiritual thinking, start using uh, the thinking that God wants us to have with the, the presence of the Holy Spirit in us as we seek to follow God and to honor Him and to glorify Him, He's teaching us how to rethink, to think His way. And thinking His way is to realize that we must always trust in Him, not on ourselves. That it's not about us. That it's not about how hard we can try or how good we are or how good our talents are. Uh, if that was the case, then some people would be better off than others. Then uh, you would feel sorry for yourself because you weren't as talented as someone else or you weren't as good looking as someone else. There'd be a hierarchy amongst people. But that's not what it is with God. That's not the way it is uh, in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, we're all equal because it's about God. It's not reliant on us and our ability and what we can do. It, it's all about relying on God and giving God everything we have that we might do everything that He wants, that we desire to follow His will, that we desire to do what He wants us to do. And the only way we can do that is by trusting in Him, not on our own wisdom. In fact, uh, Jesus is very clear on that uh, in one chapter past uh, the one we just read in, in chapter 14 in chapter 15 of John verse 5 Jesus says apart from me you can do nothing if you remember that verse John 15 5 the whole verse says I'm the vine Jesus is talking about himself he's saying I'm the vine and you are the branches we are the branches if a man remains in me or abides in me, I will abide in him and he will bear much fruit. And then Jesus makes the statement, apart from me, you can do nothing. On your own, you can't do anything. You're not going to be able to accomplish the things that are meaningful, that the things that God wants us to accomplish. And so he's, he's trying to teach us and trying to help us from the struggle and say, stop trying to do it on your own. Stop trying to fulfill your own plans. Stop trying in your own effort and in your own ability. Stop. Don't be troubled. Trust me. Trust in my process. Let me, let's look at an example of that. If we look in, uh, at the life of, uh, in the Old Testament of Joshua, uh, and the Israelites, if you remember, uh, Moses led the, the Israelites, uh, well, God led them, but he picked Moses as the person uh, to lead the, the nation of Israel out of Egypt, uh, following God, uh, escaped from the Egyptians, and were coming into the, the promised land. And there's a bunch of other things that happen in there, but there's a, it comes to a time when Moses' time of leading the people is at an end, and God has been raising up Joshua as an apprentice to Moses, so that when Moses, Moses dies, then he, he brings Joshua along to become the new leader to lead Israel into the Promised Land. Well, we find at the beginning of Joshua that they are now entering into the Promised Land. And in chapter 3, if you want to read there, I'm not going to read it, I'm, I'm just going to share with you the account. But later, after this, if you want to go back and read for yourself, it's found in Joshua chapter 3, that we see Joshua and the Israelites are, for them to be able to continue on, uh, entering into the, into the land that God has given them, uh, they have to cross the Jordan River. Because uh, the, next, the next step for them, the, for them to continue on in, requires them to cross the river. Well, it's at a time of the year when the river is flowing, uh, and, and I don't know if it's because of the spring waters or the, or the spring rain, or, or I, I'm not sure of the geography and the culture, but it says that it's at harvest time when the river uh, is at its, at its height, and so it's overflowing its banks. And God instructs Joshua to send the priests with the ark ahead of the people. And the people are supposed to stay back. And the, the priests are to walk, hold, carrying the ark, 
and they're supposed to walk up to the river, and as the sole of their shoe touches the water, the water is going to stop, the river is going to just stop where it is, and it's going to create, he's going to have dry land for all of the nation of Israel to cross. The, the priests are to stand in the center of the river with the ark and allow the whole nation to cross the river. And then when they're done, they, they are to, the priests are to continue out of and come out of the river and the river continues. Well, can, you can imagine that when God tells Joshua this, uh, in, in our worldly thinking, We've got to look at that and go, that doesn't make any sense. How is that going to happen? Can you imagine being one of the priests, especially the priests at the front of the ark? You know, the first two priests, one on each side holding the pole, and they're about to step in, and it's just like that Indiana Jones movie about taking a step of faith. And you can't see me on the video, but if you take that step of faith out into nowhere, you know, here they are, there's this rushing river, and those first two priests, but all of them are about to go, okay, here we go. God said to take a step out into the water, and they do, and as they do, the Bible tells us that the river stops, and it like dams itself up. Well, God dams it at the, at, you know, in a distance in front of the ark, and of course the water goes past down the river this way, and not only does he stop the water, but he dries the ground underneath the water so that the whole nation of Israel can cross onto the other side of the, of the river. Well, the Israelites not, didn't just read about this. They experienced it for themselves. What an amazing thing. The Bible says that they took time to worship God and to praise Him for all that He did and were excited about the fact of God giving them this promised land, this being a, 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 an amazing example of how God is going to use His power to help them. Now, what did they do there? They trusted God, they trusted His process, and so they followed His command and were obedient to do what He said, and by following that process, trusting in it, they successfully were able to cross the river on dry ground. Now, here's the next thing that you look in Joshua chapter 6. Here's the next uh, uh, mountain or, or next hurdle that the nation of Israel faces. And it's the, it's the story of Jericho. And many of you probably know this story. And here we are. This is the first, sort of the, the, the gateway to the, the rest of the promised land, is this highly fortified city of Jericho. Uh, it's renowned. There, there's even evidence of uh, talk of this city in other historical documents outside of the Bible. This, the Bible tells us that Jericho had, was walled with two separate walls. And so it had really thick walls, and it not only one and high, but it had two of them with a space in between, making it even more difficult for an army to try to take over the city. In fact, the Bible tells us, uh, we understand from history, that uh, the walls are so thick that the people of Jericho used to do chariot racing around on the top of the wall around the city. So you can imagine how thick each wall is if it's, there's enough room for horses and a chariot to race on one wall and another one on the other wall and to race around uh, is just, that's in incredible. Well here Joshua and Israel are faced with how are we going to take over this uh, this city. Well, Joshua seeks God for his uh, command, and God tells him, this is what I want you to do. I don't want you to take the army. I want you to just take all the priests, and I want you to take everybody, and I just want you to walk around the outside of the city once every day. And I want you to do that for six days in a row, and then on the seventh day, I want you to walk around the city seven times. And on the seventh time, I want you to command uh, the people to blow their horns. And I'm God. I'm going to cause the walls of Jericho just to fall down. And you'll be able to go in and take over the city. Now, he, he also very specifically tells them, 
not to take any spoils from Jericho. It doesn't tell us why he tells us to do that. And that's like in life. Sometimes God doesn't tell us why we're supposed to do something. But that's why we need to trust him when he tells us to do something. And so he tells the people not to take any spoils. No, don't take any of the animals. Uh, they're to, to kill all of them. And they're not to take any of the gold, not to take any of the wealth, not to take any of the, the robes or, or any riches of any kind. They're supposed to just destroy them all. So, Joshua was a trained military man. Now, you can imagine that that doesn't follow military process. That, that's not a plan that you would put together from a military education. But you know, you see here that Joshua is a man of God, and he's seeking to follow God, and he's seeking to help the nation of Israel to obey God. And so, they do what God says. And sure enough, on the seventh day, the seventh time around the city, they blow their horns, the walls fall down, the people of Jericho, who have been making fun of them all week as they just walk around the city, are scared spitless, and they just fall all over themselves. In fact, they, they end up killing some of themselves in their frenzy and in their fear. And the entire city is destroyed. The, the scripture tells us, though, that at the end of that great victory, amazing uh, expression of God's power in how Israel had nothing to do with it. A exact example of God's hand taking care of the need and the people not doing anything. But in the beginning of chapter 7, the Bible tells us that there were some in the, just a couple, a few people that didn't listen to the instructions and they took some of the riches and some of the wealth from the city for themselves and, and stored it among their things. Now Joshua probably didn't even know about this, but it didn't matter. It says that God burned with anger against Israel because they're of their disobedience. Because they did not trust in his process. And so the next stage, after they've had this wonderful victory, uh, there's another city just a little ways further on, and it's called Ai. Uh, and I think is how you pronounce it. And Joshua sends out some spies to, to, to look it over, and they check it out. And they come back and they report and they say, oh, you know what? It's a small place. There's not very many people. We don't even have to bother to... You take all of our people up there, the whole army, the whole nation. You know, 3,000 men are, should suffice. Let's just take a few men, go there. It'll be easy to take it over. I mean, look what we just did to Jericho. This will be a piece of cake. And so they go ahead and they do that. And sure enough, the people of Ai uh, come out and, and come against them with such force that it, 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 it they kills a number of the people of Israel and, and scares them away and they flee in, in fear. And they come back and gather and Joshua is trying to figure out what's going on. Like this is trouble because not only have we failed at this, but we've had success up until now because the nations around had heard what was going on as Israel was coming into this land and how their God was coming before them and was destroying everything that came before them and was, was helping them to accomplish this task. Now all of a sudden, if the people it, around in the, in the country find out about this, they're not going to be afraid anymore and they might come in and just try to take Israel over. Well, God reveals to Joshua what's happened. And he reveals that they're were those that took from Jericho. And that's why they failed. Now, I would also say that as you read that, before the river of Jordan, before the city of Jericho, Joshua seeks God's command, God's wisdom, God's advice on what they're supposed to do. But what happens before Ai is he reverts to his human 
thinking, his military education, thinks oh, we've got this under control, sends ahead of the spies, and follows the plan that would normally be taken. Notice that it doesn't stop to ask God what his process is. Plus, on top of that, you've got the fact that there was disobedience. The people didn't trust God enough to follow his process. And God reveals to Joshua through, you can read that in chapter 7, how God reveals to Joshua who the people are and, and the, they, they get punishment. Uh, part of it is a lesson too that says that it's not just what happens to you as a person. Your decision spiritually doesn't just affect you. In God's kingdom, we're all intertwined together. And when we don't trust God and we don't trust his process, that impacts the entire body. We can look at that as a church. When we're trying to make decisions as an individual or as a family, if we decide not to ask God and, and not to trust him and to follow his process in doing something, in choosing that, in being obedient and disobedient in that way, that can bring consequences on the whole body. And so there's, there's a, a, a second layer of learning here that applies to us today that not only is it important for us to trust God and his process for how our life is lived out and, and how he can care for us, but it's a responsibility on us because how we live our life impacts the life of the church body. Of, of God's kingdom and it reflects on his people if we do poorly if we disobey God it reflects back on God and so we need to realize that trusting God is important for us as individuals but it's also important for us as a whole body serving and working and living together seeking to follow God as a whole well if you can imagine here the, the, this is not the only time in Scripture that there is an example of, of trusting God. All throughout Scripture, you'll, you see, as you read through the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are those people or those groups of people, nations, whether it's Israel or someone else, who trusts God, and God blesses them, or they choose not to trust God and they choose to uh, approach a situation in their own way of doing things and that brings about destruction. It brings ab about problem and, and, and consequences and all kinds of things. So what should we learn today? I hope that you can make the connection. I hope that you can see that as God is telling us that we don't need to be troubled, that we just need to trust in him, that we see in the story of Joshua and the Israelites that they trusted God and his process and followed his command, listened to hear what he had to say, and followed his will, and they had success crossing the river of Jordan. They followed the same process and trusted God and trusted his process in approaching the city of Jericho, and God blessed them. They chose to do it their own way when it came to the town of Ei, and they failed miserably. This is not just truth from history. This truth applies to us today. How we live our life. If we stop and listen and seek God's face, for what it is that he wants us to do, we, we look to see what is his will, and we trust him, and trust his process, even though sometimes it may seem kind of scary. You take that step out into nowhere, or as the priest did, out into that rushing river, but you trust him, and he blesses. And that promise is for us as well. God promises us that if we'll just trust him, that he will bless us as we are following him in obedience. 
God is clearly promising us that no matter what the struggle is we are facing, we can trust him and trust his process. Whatever your trouble or struggle you are facing right now, I want to encourage you to take it to the Lord in prayer and trust him with it. Trust him in the process that he is going to lead you through it and on to the other side. You know, maybe some of you are in, in your life right now are facing a hill or what, what feels like a mountain. Uh, and you're trying to climb that mountain. Uh, and, it, and it just feels like you're not getting any, uh, anywhere. You're not gaining anything. Uh, or, or maybe you feel like the Israelites crossing the river. Maybe you feel like you're trying to cross a rushing river. And it just seems like it's an impossible task. Or maybe there's just some giant in your life that you just can't seem to, to figure out how you're going to be able to defeat this giant, this struggle, this trouble, this problem, this stress in your life. And you don't know what you're going to do. Well, I hope that you will realize today that God is saying to you, don't be troubled. Trust me. Trust in my process. Listen to what I have to say, follow my will, and you can trust each step as you take it in faith that God will care for you, God will provide for you, God will help you get through the storm and get through to the other side. He'll help you overcome that mountain. He'll help you to cross that rushing river. He'll help you to defeat that giant in your life that's, uh, that's been causing so much problem. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust God. Trust in Jesus. Let's take time right now to just bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful to you for the love that you have for us, for how you care for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust you with all everything that's in our life, with every decision, with every direction that we're going, with every issue, with every trouble, problem, whatever it is that comes in our life, no matter how big or how small it is, I pray, Lord, that you will help us to trust you and trust in your process, to walk with you in faith, uh, to know and be comforted that we don't need to feel fear, we don't need to be troubled, we don't need to get stressed, but that we can have peace in you as you guide us through each step of the way, each day of our life. Thank you, Jesus, for how you love us. Thank you that you uh, are the one who can be trusted, that you are so faithful. I pray, Lord, that you are with each and every person, wherever they're at today, that you would be working in, working in each and every one of our hearts and our lives. And I pray that you would help all of us to learn to trust you more, to just trust you completely, not just more. The goal is to trust you completely. Help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let me just leave you with Romans chapter 15, verse 13. For those of you who uh, were still here gathering with us uh, when we are worshiping in person, uh, we often said this verse. I haven't brought it up lately, but I really felt God leading me to uh, it today that it applied to what he's taught us this morning. And I want to just leave you with it. Uh, so Romans chapter 15, verse 13 says this, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray that that is true for you in this week that you have ahead of you. Uh, 
I hope that you will please join us here again next week. And until then, God bless.